Okay, we're, we're in uh, 16. We've just gone into, into the resurrection. And as I mentioned, after the Sabbath ended, which would be s- Saturday night, sundown, then you had the, the women went shopping to buy some spices, and they are going to go and anoint the Lord early uh, after, after the sun rises. They head out, and it's still night, apparently, when, they're, when they begin. It's a full moon. Uh, whether there's any light coming yet from the sun, but it's quite dark. The sun, it seems, when you're putting these things together, it, it breaks the horizon while they are on their way. And they get there, and as they're traveling to the tomb, you have Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and you have Salome, and they're going there, and, and they, it dawns on them. They say, well, how, how in the world are we going to move that stone? And as I said last week, you know, people think, well, how could it not dawn on you? You, You've all had that experience where you just haven't thought of something. And then as you approach it, it hits you and you go, oh, well, we're in trouble because we won't be able, we won't be able to move that stone. Now, they clearly were not expecting a resurrection, right? I mean, that's important. They're not expecting a resurrection. They're going there to anoint a corpse. And so as they approach, they look up and they see that the stone had already been rolled back. So they come up here and they see the stone is rolled back. And in Matthew chapter 28, verses 2 to 4, that informs us that an awesome appearing angel, this angel who looks like lightning and clothes as white as snow, that angel had rolled back the stone. Now presumably he did this while the women were en route to the tomb. He rolls back that stone and he sat on it. Now, whether the resurrected Lord exited through that opening or not is not mentioned. I'm guessing he did. I know a lot of times we say, well, it was open to let the people in, not to let him out. Well, I don't see any reason he wouldn't have come out through there. But it's not said. Now, the angel's presence terrified the Roman guards. Mark doesn't mention that. But in Matthew in 28, 2-4, it says they trembled and became like dead men. So these guys are on the ground, they're not moving. It's like, uh uh-oh. And so it just terrifies them. You think, well, what is there about it? Well, this is how angels are. You know, they always make angels out like, you know, this little flying baby kind of thing. And no, the angels are, you know, when you see one, depending on how he wants to manifest. But he's serious. And so when they saw this angel, they were terrified. And we can assume that they fled as soon as they regained the strength to do so. I mean, if they're trembling, they fall down as though dead. My guess is, is when they get the strength to get out, they're leaving. Because they don't want to be around there. Then it seems, see, you, you, you try to put things together. And it seems then that the angel withdrew into the tomb. So as not to frighten the women so that they would go into the tomb. So he rolls the stone back, he's sitting on it, he blows the mind of the Roman guards, they're terrified, they, I assume, wind up fleeing when they regain the strength, he then retreats into the tomb so as not to frighten the women when they come in. And then we see in verses 5 to 8, they enter, the women enter the open tomb, and at some point they see sitting on the right side there an angel Mark says, who appears like a young man dressed in a white robe. He's dressed in a white Now, whether this is the dazzling thing, I assume it is, because in Luke 24, 4, he speaks of two men who stood by them in dazzling apparel. So, really bright white. You know, something that's saying, this is unusual. And there, there, they see him in there. Now, Luke mentions two. Mark only mentions one. And that happens a number of times where one is just focused on one. And as you can imagine, the women were alarmed. They come into the tomb. They're going to anoint Jesus. They see the stone roll back. They go, hmm. They go into the tomb and they see this angel here. So, yeah, I can imagine they're alarmed. Now, without getting into a full-blown harmony of the accounts. You see, harmonizing the various resurrection appearances and that kind of thing would take me a while. But let me just note that it seems from John's account, it seems from his account that when Mary Magdalene, when she saw the open tomb, 
So they're approaching, they see the tomb, when they saw the stone roll back, when she sees the open tomb, she jumped to the conclusion that the body had been stolen. And then she turns and runs off to tell Peter and John. So it would be the other women. So you have Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome. It would be the other women, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, Salome, and possibly other women who joined them there, like Joanna and Susanna. So other women going in there. Now Mark doesn't, he's silent about that, but as I say, putting some things together, that looks like what happened. And the angel said to the women in the tomb, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. You know they laid him there. He's not there. And I'm telling you the reason he's not there. It is not because someone took the body which would not be all of that, uh, that terribly uncommon, where people would rob graves looking for valuables. But he says, no, he's risen. The tomb is empty because it is a resurrection. The grave is empty, not because of robbery, but because of resurrection. And he adds, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee there you will see him just as he told you. You'll see him there just as he told you. Now Mark Strauss in his commentary, he says, Peter is likely singled out, not only because of his key leadership role among the disciples, but especially in light of his need for restoration after denying Jesus. Both Luke and Paul report unique resurrection appearances to Peter apart from the other disciples probably for this purpose. So the Lord has large things in mind for Peter, and he is going to restore Peter and let Peter know that, okay, you know, I'm well aware of what happened, but let's get on with it. You see, so he's going to do that. <clears throat> now, Jesus had told them in Mark 14, 28, <clears throat> that after he was raised, he would meet with them in Galilee. You see, that's their home turf. That's where the ministry began. He said he would meet with them in Galilee. Now, that doesn't mean that they would see him only in Galilee. It doesn't mean that. Rather, this is where he would regather and recommission his scattered army for their post-resurrection witness, which would begin back in Jerusalem. But he's going to have them gather together, and he's going to recommission them. For that post-resurrection witness which is going to start back in Jerusalem. So the women, they went out and they ran from the tomb. They ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment had seized them. And that's a common reaction to an encounter with an angel to say nothing of the announcement of the Lord's resurrection. So we look at the eye, well how could it be? Come on. Look what the Roman soldiers did. I mean, they just saw the angel, and they were flipped out. And here these women walk in there, and there's this angel there. And then he tells them, he's risen. Well, you know, it's like, what? What's going on? What is, what is reality? What is happening? And so he tells them that. So they, they want off. They, they leave, and they're trembling, and they're, they're, uh, they're astonished. And they wind up there, they, they, they take off, and in verse 8 says, They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So they come out, they're trembling like that, they, they just take off. And Mark Strauss says that, and by the way, the trembling, you know, that's, that's simply a, a, a reaction to an, an, an adrenaline dump. If you've ever had, you know, where you've really been startled like that, you let that pass, and you'll be trembling uncontrollably for a period of time when your body gets there and that's what happened when they wound up being being startled like that but Mark Strauss says now when we consider 9 to 20 I'm going to share some thoughts with you about this Mark Strauss says virtually all scholars agree 
Now, when you have somebody who's doing a, a significant commentary on Mark and he says that, he's in that world. So his opinion about what is, what, how do scholars weigh this, uh, it's important. Does that mean everybody agrees? No, it doesn't mean. There's, there's almost nothing on which everyone agrees. Okay, but Strauss says virtually all scholars agree that the verses that follow in the standard English versions, the standard English translations, verses 9 to 20, virtually all scholars agree that they are not part of the original gospel of Mark. Now, you can go, and if, if you want to explore that, there are a lot of resources you can go and look at the ins and outs and the details of what leads virtually all scholars to that conclusion. In particular, there is a book published in 2008, edited by David Allen Black, titled Perspectives on the Ending of Mark, Four Views, have at it. Go and you can see them, you know, guy says this, another guy comes in and says that, and so you can chew on that. But basically what you have is that the, the longer ending, that 9 to 20, that longer ending, it existed by the second century, so it's early, we know that. We know it existed by the second century because we have a second century Christian, Irenaeus, who mentions it. But it's absent from the earliest existing manuscripts that we have of Mark that have that portion of the book. It's not present in the great 4th century manuscript Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. It's not there. And it's not in the early translations of Mark that were done into Syriac, Syriac Coptic, Latin, Armenian, Georgian. All of those early translations of Mark, no indication of verses 9 through 20. Clement of Alexandria from the 2nd century, Origen and Cyprian from the 3rd century, Cyril of Jerusalem from the 4th century, they show no awareness at all of verses 9 through 20. And Eusebius in the late 3rd and early 4th centuries, and Jerome, the great scholar from the 4th and 5th centuries, they say that verses 9 through 20 are missing from almost all Greek manuscripts. From that day, they're missing from almost all Greek manuscripts. So when you look at the external evidence, the manuscript evidence, it's decidedly against verses 9 to 20 being original. And then the internal evidence, what you see from the text itself, is against 9 to 20 being original. There's no good explanation for why a scribe would omit that entire section. Just fail to copy it or just drop it off. Whereas it's, it's easy to see how this abrupt ending at verse 8, you can see how that would give rise to a longer ending. Because you would have scribes who would be thinking, something must have happened to the copy that I have. And so I at least should give some information here about the appearances. So you can see how that would happen. And in fact, you have a variety of endings. You don't just have what we have in standard English versions 9 to 20. You have three or four variations off of that. And so that goes along with the idea that, it, that there was a scribal sense of incompleteness. That somehow we needed to give them what they assumed had been lost. And so that would make some sense. In addition, the connection of verse 9 with verse 8 it's quite awkward. The vocabulary and style of verses 9 to 20 are distinctly non-Markan. As Strauss says, he says, quote, with 15 words that do not appear elsewhere in Mark and a number of others used in different sense than typical Markan usage. And then Strauss gives his conclusion, which echoes that of most scholars. He says, the longer ending, 9 to 20, represents a compendium of resurrection appearances from other Gospels and was likely composed by a second century copyist disturbed by the abrupt ending of Mark. So if it's in the second century, the scribe has access to Matthew and Luke. Okay, Mark's probably the first. And so you can see how somebody, if they're thinking, well, something has happened, 
So let me at least then give them a compendium of these appearances and that kind of thing. Now that somehow, that, you know, I, that makes some sense to me. And that's why the text is often in your English translation. Many times it's bracketed. You'll have it bracketed or you'll have it footnoted where it'll say the earliest manuscripts do not include uh, verses 9 to 20. You say, well, why is it printed at all? Well, it's printed it because of tradition and history. It got started from the early English versions. You know how that is, particularly the King James Version. The King James was tremendously influential on the history of the English Bible. So the King James had it in there. So once the King James has it in there, and English speakers reading that translation say that's part of the Bible, now you dare mess with it. Because if you mess with it, it's then you're messing with the Bible. Okay, you're a liberal. You're trying to take away part of the Bible. Well, you think about the King James. The King James was translated. It was on the third edition of it from a, a Parisian publisher, Estienne, whose name in Latin is Stephanus. And in 1550, he publishes the third edition of his Greek New Testament, which was based largely on an earlier edition of the Greek New Testament that Erasmus had done. Now, how many manuscripts are they working off of? Maybe six. Okay, maybe six. And all of them are late. This is all before the great papyrus and manuscript discoveries of the 19th and 20th centuries. So, this is what you have. And so, but once it gets in there, you see, it's very... So now, rather than take it out, they'll just put it in brackets and say, let people know. And then if you're not inclined, you say, no, I still think that that's original. Well, okay, you have it in there. Now, given the likelihood, it seems to me, that verses 9 to 20, that it's a later scribal edition... The question then is, well, how did Mark end? Did it end this way? Or was there another ending to it that got lost? Because we can see pretty clearly, not everybody agrees, but we can see pretty clearly that 9 to 20 isn't original. And the three or four other uh, takes on that aren't original. Well, so we don't have the original, if there was one. So then the question is, you say, okay, well, how did it end? Did it end this way, or was there an original that has been lost? And so people debate that, and you have different takes on that, and how that's understand arguments on both sides. Scholars are divided about that, but a majority of commentators think that Mark ended his gospel this way, and did it, he intended to do it that way. Because you could have him ending it there by interruption, right? Maybe he didn't intend to end it there, but he had to end it there for some kind of uh, emergency or something. But most scholars think this is how Mark intended it. Well, that raises questions. You see, if you're going to say that, if you're going to say this is where Mark, this is how he, how he did it, well, then the question is, well, what, what does it mean? <laughs> you see, how do, we wind up, how do we wind up making sense of that? Now, I think that it probably did end there. I think it probably ended there, or else you, it seems to me you'd have some manuscript evidence of a more plausible original ending. You see, how would it be longer and have no manuscript evidence of it? You could say, well, very, very early on, like after Mark wrote it, he gave it to be copied to somebody and something happened to the original ending and then that was all that was left to be copied. That just seems unlikely to me. Okay, and it seems, and I think about God has inspired him to write this longer ending and then it gets taken away. Well, maybe God's doing something in that, I don't know. But that just doesn't seem, uh, doesn't really seem likely to me that he, that he was doing that. Now, if, he, if the ending is by design, you say, well, well, what's the message of such an abrupt ending? Well, and see, that's what drives the sense of, mo- of people that, listen, there has to, that can't be the ending. You see, so then we have 9 to 20, that must be it. You see, because this doesn't, doesn't make a good ending. You see, so you see the pressure that's there. And that's why you have some people say, no, 
I think there was a longer ending. I'm convinced it wasn't 9 to 20, but there had to be something else. Okay, well, it doesn't make any sense for him to end it here. I'll give you some thoughts on that. But that, I want you to see that the difficulty in answering that question is what drives the issue. Because if this was a clearly a nice, easy ending that didn't leave questions, everybody would say, okay, no question, that's where it ended. But because it's so abrupt, it raises these other issues. Now, it's important to note that Mark doesn't omit the resurrection. Okay, if it ends at verse 8, he doesn't omit the resurrection, right? Because it says in verse 6 expressly that Jesus is risen and will meet with the disciples in Galilee just as he told them. Well, maybe the stories of the resurrection appearances, maybe they were such a staple of the Christian community in Rome, the community to which Mark is writing. Maybe he deemed the angel's announcement a sufficient allusion to those accounts that they all know those things very well so he just simply needs to say he's risen and then they would all know yes he's risen and that becomes even more likely if he's completing the gospel under any kind of time constraints any kind of space constraints that he would conclude it here and leave it to be an allusion to the appearances they already knew about you remember Mark's probably the first gospel. So there, there's, uh, there's no norm already established for what needs to be in a gospel. I mean, he's the first one. So that would be something that would, would say, well, maybe he had more freedom in how he was going to do it. Now, let me tell you what I think is going on in 5 to 8, and then we'll move on and, and look at 9 to 20. But in 5 to 8, as I understand it, the women enter the tomb... And they're really deeply distressed and troubled. He is ekthambeo is the word that he uses. Now they're deeply distressed by the sight of the angel. And this is the one, one of the words that, that Mark used to describe the Lord's distress in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, in chapter 14, verse 33. So we're talking about some real deep uh, distress at this angel. Now the angel tells them not to be ekthembeo. That's the last time that word appears. They enter, they have that emotion, he tells them not to be that way. Okay, so I think they're, they're startled by him and then being, after being shown the empty tomb, told of the Lord's resurrection and instructed to tell the disciples and, and Peter that Jesus would meet them in, the, in Galilee They then exit the tomb and flee, he says, because they are trembling, like I told you that adrenaline dump, they're trembling, and they're they're astonished. Trembling and astonishment gripped them as a result of their seeing the angel and interacting and being told that the Lord had been raised from the dead, suggesting that they're emotionally overwhelmed. And disoriented by the interaction and by the news that they received. As you'd expect. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all. You know, you come in and see this, hear this, and it's like... And so that's how they were. You know, they sought distance from the scene. We might say they were freaked out. You see, in other words, they see this and they hear this, they're trying to absorb it, they just want to let me get some distance from the scene. Now, the statement in 8b, the very last part there, that they did not say anything to anyone. Okay, that would be understood, I'm convinced, by the Roman Christians who knew that the women had reported that event to the disciples, Right? I mean, that was something that the Christian community knew. That was instrumental in the blossoming of the Christian community. They all knew that as reflected in the later Gospels that you get in Matthew, you see in Luke. So they all knew that. That when it says that they didn't speak to anyone, it doesn't mean they didn't speak to the disciples. That was known. So I'm convinced that when when he says here that they didn't say anything to anyone that they would understand it to mean that they did not say anything to anyone on the way to the disciples. Now you say, well, why, why would anybody point that out? Why would anybody point out that the women didn't say anything 
to anybody on the way to the disciples. Well, some may have wondered, right? With decades of hindsight about the resurrection, about how momentous it was, about its significance, the turning point of all of history, well, how the women could have had such an experience and not have broadcast it to those they no doubt saw when they left the tomb in the morning. How could they not have said, Whoa! Come here! He's risen! He's risen! No, no, come here! No! He's risen! So maybe people are saying, mm, How could that have happened? That they didn't speak to all the people they saw out in the morning in the city of Jerusalem, but they did speak to the disciples. Okay, well, if he's, he's explaining, the way that happened was, they were freaked out. My words. They were overwhelmed. And so they went and they, they, they didn't speak to him. Now, Mark explains they didn't do so. He says because they were awestruck. Now, the way it's rendered, that is the word for fear. It says, for they were afraid. But you have to see that very word can function, not in the way we would understand fear, but in the way we understand awestruck. And you see it function precisely that way in Mark 5.33. The woman healed of bleeding. When she's healed through her contact with Jesus, it says she's afraid. Well, what does it mean? It means she's awed by the tremendous power and the greatness of the miracle that has just been worked on her. It doesn't mean that she's fearing in the sense that we would normally take that. Okay, so this idea of awestruck, you see that also in Matthew 9, 8, that same use, the healing of the paralytic. They feared, they were awestruck. So that's what it is here. It's not like they're, uh-oh, I have to be, no. They're just, they're, they're just awed, they're overwhelmed. And so that's why they weren't speaking to other people. Now, the fact the women are the first witnesses mentioned regarding the empty tomb in Mark and in the other Gospels, that's significant. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, I mentioned it many times. But it's significant because the testimony of women was regarded as untrustworthy in both Jewish and Roman cultures. You see, whatever you think of that, that was a cultural fact. In fact, the second century critic of Christianity, a Roman named Celsus, this Roman, he wound up, he, he said, look, he, he dismisses the report of the resurrection as having come from, quote, a hysterical female. Well, that gives you an idea. You see? You say, well, why are you telling me this? What's the significance of that? Well, this is powerful evidence that the gospel writers didn't make up the story of the empty tomb. Right? Because if they had, they, would have, they wouldn't have had women be the one to find it. If I'm fabricating a story for apologetic purposes, why would I undermine that purpose by having the people who find it to be culturally not credible witnesses? I wouldn't do that. I would only do that if that's what happened and if it was widely known in the community of believers that that's how it went down. Okay, so it's very significant. N.T. Wright, in his book on the resurrection of the Son of God, I know this is an eye exam, but uh, it's only one slide, I'll go through it. Wright says, even if we suppose that Mark made up most of his material and did so sometime in the late 60s at the earliest, it will not do to have him or anyone else at that stage making up a would-be apologetic legend about an empty tomb and having women be the ones who find it. The point has been repeated over and over in scholarship, but its full impact has not always been felt. Women were simply not acceptable as legal witnesses. We may regret it, but that's how the Jewish, the Jewish world and most others worked. The debate between Origen and Celsus shows that critics of Christianity could seize on the story of the women in order to scoff at the whole tale. Were the legend writers really so ignorant of the likely reaction? 
If they could have invented stories of fine, upstanding, reliable male witnesses being first at the tomb, they would have done it. That they did not tells us either that everyone in the early church knew that the women led by Mary Magdalene were in fact the first on the scene or that the early church was not so inventive as critics have routinely imagined or both. Would the other evangelists have been so slavishly foolish as to copy the story unless they were convinced that despite being an apologetic liability, it was historically trustworthy? And so this is something, see, when you, want, when you put on your historian hat and you're trying to go back and say, well, let me ignore the inspiration of the Bible and just look as a historian. Well, this is a significant fact as a historian when you're trying to assess the reliability of the accounts. And so I think that's something that's very powerful. Well, now, let's look at the, the, the last verses, 9 to 20, even though I don't think they're original. Some people do. I don't. Okay, so but let's look at what they say here, because in, in 9 to 11, here, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. All right, now, the gospel accounts of the resurrection appearances, they are not contradictory, but just how they fit together, it's a matter of speculation. Okay, if you've played around at all with things that, are, that seem like they could be contradictory, and you're trying to say, well, how can I understand these things? Is there a way? A more sympathetic reading that would not mean that they were contradictory. Well, a critic can certainly jump on the, that's a contradiction. I mean, it just depends on how, you know, where you're putting the bar, where you're putting the skeptical bar. I can think of ways that these things can all fit. And in fact, John Wenham, in his book, The Easter Enigma, the second edition of it, I have summarized that book. And it's available on my website. So if you're interested in more details about how the resurrection accounts can be harmonized, you might want to check that out. Now, as I indicated, 9, 9 to 20, it almost certainly seems to me to be the later addition uh, to the gospel. As I said, Strauss, he says, it represents a compendium of resurrection appearances from other gospels and was likely composed by a second century copyist disturbed by the abrupt ending of Mark. That makes sense to me. As I said, I don't see any, any bad intent. What I see is he thought something was missing. And he felt like, well, let me take a shot at what was missing based on what I know from other Gospels and things. So let me kind of fill this out in my best approximation of what would have been there. Because he felt like there was something gone. James Edwards, in his commentary, he labels the, that ending an early Christian resurrection mosaic okay so he takes the same thing now the transition between eight and nine as I mentioned it's awkward in that the subject shifts from the women and then it shifts to Jesus and yet Jesus isn't named in the verse it just uses the pronoun he as though it's been talking about him all along so that seems a bit awkward and then it, it, it says that and then it refers the reference to Mary Magdalene as the one from whom he cast out seven demons now, we know that's true. You can see that, though. That's from Luke 8, 2. But it seems out of place, given that she was already introduced and reported, mentioned three other times. Right? So, I mean, doesn't that seem like that's the kind of thing, that's little additional information you're going to say, Mary Magdalene, by the way, she's the one from whom... So you would put that when you first bring her up. Okay? So this is another thing that looks like, well, this is what's happened is... This is this compendium of things that are known, and that would be from Luke chapter 8, verse 2, and it seems out of place given her prior, the references to her. Now, after she saw Jesus alive, according to 9 to 11, she went to the disciples who are said, and this is unique, they're said to be weeping and mourning, or mourning and weeping. Now, John 20, 18, it reports Mary announcing to the disciples that she had seen Jesus. So that you have that in the Gospel of John. The disciples' rejection of her testimony, that echoes Luke 24, 11. You see, so this idea, this is what leads people to think what it looks like is a copyist is drawing on things he knows either from the community or from the other Gospels and kind of putting together a little thing that makes a more, an ending that is more consistent with what is known in the other Gospels. So you have those things that pop up 
the women's report where at 2411, where the, the disciples rejected it's women's report that it's said to seem like nonsense to them. Then you get to 12 and 13. Jesus appears to two travelers. All right, well, that rings bells, right? Appears to two travelers. This seems to be a summary, a, a summary account of, of the Lord's appearance to the two travelers on the road to Emmaus. Right? That, that's what that looks like in, in Luke 24, 13 to 35. And the statement that he appeared in a different form. Okay, that seems to be something, an attempt to explain how they were kept from recognizing him, as it says in Luke 24, 16. Okay, so this seems to be a little summary of that with an explanation trying to explain how they were kept from recognizing him. He appeared in a different form. All right, so you have there in 24, uh, 24, 16, they returned and report the experience to the other disciples, just as you see in Luke 24, 33 to, th- to 35, and the statement that the disciples did not believe them, that is, perhaps that's drawn from Luke 24, 38 and Luke 24, 41. And then in 14 to 18, here we have Jesus he later appears to the eleven as they, as they recline for a meal. Now this may be drawn from Luke 24, 41, where they're eating a meal may be inferred from Jesus' request for food. So here they are eating, and the rebuke for unbelief, that might be rooted in Luke 24, 38. Okay, so here you see what's, what's going on there. He, he, he appears to the eleven, there's the meal, there's the rebuke. And verse 15, it seems to recall the great commission of Matthew 28, 19. Where you have that. So they are to preach the gospel to all creation. Meaning they're to preach it to all the inhabitants of the earth. So this is something here that we, I mean, this is, this is all familiar. There's nothing, there's nothing out of the ordinary here. Now, there may be something coming up that strikes us as a bit strange. But as, as they do so in this preaching... As they preach to all the inhabitants of the earth, Jesus says in verse 16 that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, though, again, I don't think this is part of the original gospel of Mark. I don't go there when I'm trying to teach somebody about baptism other than to say this clearly reflects an early at least a second century understanding of baptism. So it's significant, right? But I don't point to it as authoritative. Now, if you believe that's, that's part of the original, that's inspired, okay. But it's still significant because you have a very early indication of how was baptism understood to function. Now, as you know, some say, well, this verse doesn't say anything about the fate of one who believes and is not baptized. Right? You've heard that. No, no, no. It doesn't say. It. it says somebody who believes and is baptized, well, he'll be saved. One who does not believe, he'll be condemned. Ah, but it doesn't talk about one who believes and is not baptized. But that's the function of and. <laughs> you know, that's the function of and. The logic of it strikes me this way. Whoever has a ticket and boards the bus will be given a ride. But whoever doesn't have a ticket will be left. You see, I mean, that's how and functions. Otherwise, why say and? So I know people say that, but it just strikes me as, eh, I I don't find it very impressive. I don't find it very good response. It seems quite clear what he's talking about. Now, Jesus then lists signs that will accompany those who believe. Okay, things that will be characteristic or will be present in the community of believers. Things that will occur within the Christian community. They will exorcise demons in his name. They will speak in new tongues. Okay, meaning new to them, languages they didn't know. They will pick up snakes with their hands, the implication being and not be hurt. Okay, 
be protected from harm when they drink poison, and they will heal the sick by laying the laying on of their hands. Now, according to verse 20, which we'll look at in just a second briefly, but according to verse 20, these signs did indeed accompany the disciples' preaching. Right? I mean, these things are noted in the New Testament. Nearly all of them. Right? Weren't they part of what was going on in the first? Yeah. These things, they're, they're noted in the Paul cast out a demon from the fortune-telling slave girl. In Acts 16, 18, he spoke in tongues, as did other people. He was bitten by a viper without harm. In Acts 28, 3 to 5, and he did extraordinary miracles through his hands. As you see in Acts 19, 11, and 12, including the healing of Publius' father and others in Acts 28, 8, and 9. Now, the fact there's no report of a disciple being unharmed after drinking poison doesn't mean that didn't occur. All of these other things we know occurred. They happened within the community of believers. So I, I feel sure that something like this happened. They had access to that knowledge and information. And so wh whoever did this mentions that. Those are things that will, that will be characteristic or will be included there. But it's important to see that, that in this text, Jesus doesn't say how long these things will occur among Christians, right? He simply says that these things will occur and be a part of the Christian community. Does he say forever? He doesn't. Does he say they will always be there? No. He simply says they will be there and they were there. Because we know that from what we see in the New Testament. And verse 20 specifies that the purpose of those signs was to confirm the word they preached. Right? It says that it was to confirm the word that they preached. In other words, to indicate that their message was in fact from God. So here comes this message into this world. This resurrected Messiah, King of kings, Lord of lords, returning to judge. He's the only way. And God has said, I am going to put my imprimatur on this message by doing miracles and things to show you that that is in fact of me. Now, having done that, and having recorded that inerrantly, his having done that, he records it inerrantly for all posterity, must he continue to do it? I would say, no, I, I, I can see a rationale for why he may, having recorded it inerrantly for all posterity, not continue to do it. And in fact, there's this group, I may have mentioned, is that the second bell? There's this group, Dude Perfect, hang with me, because this has been a long journey. Let me finish this. This, you know, Dude Perfect, what do they do? They do all kinds of strange things, throw basketballs from like the 20th story and go through the, what do they do? They record it on a video. Put it on the internet. And then every time somebody says, well, did you do that? They don't say, let me go do it again. They just say, watch the video. Okay, well, God has done it. He's confirmed it. He just says, go read the text. I've recorded it. I've done it inerrantly. And there it is for you to read. So I would see a rationale. Last thing, two verses. So then the Lord, here we have the ascension. After he'd spoken, he was taken up to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. They went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Okay, that did occur. That happened there. No guarantee or promise or commitment that it's going to continue. And I see a good rationale for it not. Okay, and as I look around, I think the kinds of things that they're talking about did cease. Okay, uh, long journey. Thank you for coming. Next week, Lord willing, First Thessalonians.